Welcome back to our series, First Days, Last Days, the series where we're taking four weeks to talk about the life of the early church and hopefully gain some context so that we can then take four weeks and talk about what the Bible says about the last days. In the first week of our series, we looked at the historical context of the New Testament, just gave you some background of everything that led up to the time of Jesus and the apostles. Last week, Pastor Wade talked about the power of the resurrection in really propelling the gospel message. Uh, rumors are that it is one of the most gruesome messages you may have ever heard at Renewed Church, but he got into the details of what happened to a number of the disciples later on in their life and just the faith that they had and how that propelled the faith of other believers in the early church. Today, I want to discuss kind of the Jewish and Gentile dimensions and how they sort of clashed as we continue to give you a little bit of historical context. And so today is week three, understanding the Jewish and Gentile dimensions of the early church. Let's start by talking about the strategy of the apostles, shall we? As they were, you know, leaving Pentecost and going out and proclaiming the gospel, it's important to see the strategy that the apostles were employing. It's very noteworthy and it gives us a lot of insight. So after Pentecost, they began to spread the good news, first of all, by addressing the Jews. It was very much a Jews first mentality that they had. In fact, take a look in Acts chapter two, verse 14. It says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. And so you can see, he starts it by addressing the Jews, fellow Jews, he says. And Peter goes on to quote the Hebrew scripture to them. In verses 22 and 29 of that chapter, he uses the term fellow Israelites. And so again, he's very much targeting the Jewish people. And Peter showed them from their own scriptures what had been prophesied about the Messiah and how it applied to Jesus. And he even targets the Jews in his speech, sometimes with some of the negative and the barbs that he's giving them. Look at verse 36 of chapter 2. He says, therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So let all Israel be assured. And he says, you crucified. He's being very directive here. He was giving a very clear and divisive message. He was saying, guys, you killed the Messiah. And now you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And so this is a very direct message that he's giving, and it's to the Jewish people. Many people responded, even though the message was very direct. 3,000 were added to their number that day, it says, on that first day of proclamation. And in verse 46 of chapter 2, it says that they met every day in the temple courts. Again, think Jewish here. This is where the Jews hung out in the temple courts. They were going and approaching Jews with this message. They had the understanding of God, of Old Testament scripture, of messianic promises. It was the natural first step in taking the gospel to the world. And in the first verse of chapter 3, we see Peter and John going up to where? To the temple. They're going up to the temple. Again, it's very Jewish focused. So guys, make note of this. It's very important. The message the apostles shared was a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but it was very much in view of Christ returning to set up his kingdom. You need to understand this. This was the view that they had as Jewish people. It was Christ, the Messiah, coming back to set up his kingdom. It was a message that Jews understood and resonated with incredibly. And so don't miss that. That's kind of the underlying context that sometimes we miss as we're just reading our New Testament. In chapter 3, we continue to see the words fellow Israelites. Look at what it says starting at verse 17 here. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. He's talking about crucifying the Messiah, Jesus. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all of the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So this is a very powerful passage that the Jews, you know, would have resonated with this speech that Peter is making. Peter tells them that Jesus was gone to heaven until God is ready to restore everything. You see that? Again, more of this messianic language 
He's going to come and restore everything the way that the Jews had anticipated, to take over and to take control not only of Jerusalem and of Israel, but of the world through that throne in Jerusalem. The Jews understood the Messianic promises very well. They also, get this guys, they also understood that this was a time of judgment that would be coming and that those who weren't aligned with the Messiah when he came were going to be judged for that. He used the term cut off there in that verse. They were going to be cut off. So guys, you need to understand the Jews were highly motivated here. And as Peter's being very direct and preaching this gospel to them, they were motivated. They were at a moment in history that had huge positive and negative motivators connected, right? Positive, they could be part of this kingdom. Negative, they would be cut off from God's people. And so you didn't want to be on the wrong side of this history. That's how the Jews felt in this moment. They all wanted to be part of Messiah's kingdom. Well, when you get to Acts chapter 4, we see the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees getting upset and seizing Peter and John. And so I want to give you a little bit of a sidebar here just so you understand some of the different groups and players that are at play in the New Testament as you're reading it. The first group is the Sadducees, and we see that here in chapter 4. This is a Jewish sect that came through the priestly line in Israel. And all of the high priests and the officials were actually Sadducees at that time. The high priest was a Sadducee, and he was the chief priest who was over the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is kind of like the council. And because this is a religious state, that would be like our members of parliament, right? Or the House of Representatives in the states. So they were powerful and they were privileged, the Sadducees were. They were in control. Now, you should also know they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in an afterlife. Some things that we hold as pretty basic and that other Jews believed in, they did not. And the reason is because the Sadducees only held to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the law, the Torah. And in the Torah, afterlife stuff isn't mentioned there. And so because that's all they held to, they didn't see an afterlife. They didn't see a resurrection. They actually, if you study it out, they actually believed that they were in the Messianic age already. Now, other Jews were furious at that concept. They're like, we're under Roman rule. How could we possibly be in the Messianic age? But the Sadducees thought, you know, even though they were under Roman rule, they saw life as being pretty good for them, right? They were kind of in control and had the chance to kind of set things the way they wanted them. And the last thing that they needed right now was for these apostles to come along talking about a resurrected Jesus and upsetting their privileged position. They liked how they had it set up at that moment. And so the Sadducees were not happy to hear Peter and John and the other apostles preaching this news of Jesus. The Sadducees were also not liked by the people because they were seen as being selfish and corrupt and honestly just self-serving. So that's the Sadducees. The next group that we see is the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, they're zealots, right? They are all about ritual purity. We could say that they are legalists, uh, and that would be an accurate term. Uh, You know, maybe some people that are very legalistic in their religion today, this is how they were. Now, they were actually descendants of the Hasidim. We talked about them uh, in week one. These were the ones that fought in the Maccabean Revolt and resisted. And so you should know that these guys are very proud. They're very committed to their religion. And they took observance of the law to all new, let's be honest, ridiculous levels. They made rule upon rule to make sure that they were following the law just so. So there was a lot of pride tied up in that. And they developed complex traditions that the Sadducees just rejected. They're like, no, we're not on the same page as you guys. Um, The Pharisees still did make their way into the Sanhedrin and at different times in history actually had a larger proportion of it and dominated the Sanhedrin. And they did enjoy a good deal of public support. Uh, They were much more popular with the public than the Sadducees were. But usually they were in the minority. And just again, as another side note, they did believe in the resurrection. So score them one for that. They did believe in the resurrection. So you have the Sadducees, you have the Pharisees, and then you also have the scribes. As the name suggests, these guys were the ones who copied the scriptures. And they were distinct from the Sadducees and from the Pharisees. But they often worked with the Pharisees. In fact, in the New Testament, you will see that they're often mentioned together. The Pharisees and the scribes, it will say. 
Here's the thing. Many Jews who wanted to avoid all of the politics and just know what the law was prescribing so they could live their life according to the law, instead of going to the Sadducees or the Pharisees and all of the fighting that took place there, they would just go directly to the scribes, which was actually a pretty good strategy because the scribes understood the scriptures and they can tell them what the the scripture actually said so they could practice it. So it's a good thing to know about the scribes. In all of that, I think it's good to understand the different players that you see in the New Testament, as you're reading the text, it's going to make things a little bit clearer. You're going to see their motivations coming through in different times and places. It's also valuable because you need to understand that the Jewish mindset wasn't completely homogenous at this time, like it is in any culture. There's different ideologies, different factions, different political motivations, and so on. But let's get back to the apostle strategy because that's what we were talking about here. Not only would they visit the temple courts and not only would they proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah to everyone that they met. But another thing that they loved to do was to perform miracles, miraculous signs in these very public Jewish dominated places, right? Jesus had given them the ability, the Holy Spirit was giving them this power to perform these miraculous signs and they knew it at that time. And so they could do this. And when they did it, they understood it was very controversial. It got the religious leaders involved and it often resulted in persecution. But you need to understand, and you'll see this as you read the book of Acts, the apostles actually welcomed it. It was all good to them because it just helped draw attention to their message and to spread the gospel everywhere that they went. But understand, the apostles' strategy was definitely Jew first. And this is important to understand. They went to the Jews before the Gentiles. As you move along and you get to Acts chapter 6, you see now this tension between Grecian versus Hebraic Jews. And so that's the next thing I want to talk to you about. When you get there to Acts chapter 6, you see this interesting development. The number of disciples was increasing very quickly. Again, these are Jewish people. And the church was made up of these Jewish people. And it's just growing and growing. And there's bigger crowds of people. And they're in Jerusalem. But there was a divide between the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews. Now, what are we talking about with these two groups? The Hebraic Jews were those who grew up in Palestine. They spoke Hebrew, hence the name Hebraic Jews. And these guys lived as religious Jews. They were Jews through and through. But Grecian Jews were Hellenists, meaning that they were from Greek culture. They grew up outside of Palestine. They spoke the Greek language, and they identified more with Greek culture than they did with Hebrew culture, and they would have been less religious. And so you see... As one may suspect, the Grecian Jews could easily be considered lesser Jews. And it was their widows who were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. When you look at Acts chapter 6, you know, even Christian people, isn't it stunning? Christian people sometimes don't always act like Jesus. They're not always even-handed or fair. And so to solve this problem, the leaders of the church decide to choose seven men to rectify the problem. And when you look at the passage in Acts 6, what you see very quickly is that all seven of them had Greek names. So this was smart. The leaders were choosing Greek men to oversee Greek problems. This is actually a leadership lesson that you will learn. Um, Here it is. Put those most affected by an issue in charge of solving the issue. I learned this very early in ministry and in leadership, that this is generally a good principle. Not always, but Most times, this is a good principle. If you have people that are upset about something or have an issue to solve, say, okay, I'm going to help you out, but I'm going to put you in charge of kind of looking into this and addressing this problem because they're passionate for it. One of the things we see here in Acts 6 is that uh, one of the men that was listed to be part of that seven to solve the issue was a man named Nicholas from Antioch. And it says there that he was a convert to Judaism. So now, guys, this is significant. We are also starting to see non-Jews convert to the way and come into this followership of Jesus and be part of the early church. Well, Stephen was the first name that was on that list. Uh, He was obviously well-respected. He was on this list of Grecian Jews. And we know that he was the one that got martyred. And we see that there in chapter 7. And in chapter 8, verse 1, we see this gentleman named Saul who was there consenting to his death. And Saul is going to become the central figure in the New Testament from this point on. I want to talk about the diaspora a little bit as well, this dispersing of the Jewish people. 
the stoning of Stephen actually triggered a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. That's what you see from chapter 8 on in the book of Acts. Now it's persecution, and the early followers begin to be scattered throughout the known world. Little note here, guys, and this is important. God has often used persecution to scatter his people and to propel the advancement of the gospel message. Last week, Pastor Wade talked about the martyred disciples, and we still haven't gotten to that point now. We're kind of earlier in history today talking about this, but he, he talked about where a lot of these disciples ended up and how they were persecuted, how they were killed for their faith. And guys, that's important to understand that God uses this persecution to actually move people in the places where he wants them to be. So I want to give you a little challenge here this morning. Guys, I want to challenge you to try to see how adversity and even separation can be used by God for his greater purposes. You know, sometimes when these things happen, adversity comes against the church or we get divided in ways that we don't like. We have to understand God uses all of these things for his purposes. We tend to get upset by those things, usually because they interfere with our human plans and our personal agendas and the things that we want for us and our families. But here's the thing, guys. There's a bigger agenda going on. I'd love to see, hear you say amen back to me this morning. There is a bigger agenda going on. And we, we need to get our eyes on this. Life is not about what we're wanting to do. It's about what God is wanting to do in the world and wanting to do through us. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, I love this verse. Such a short verse, but look at what it says. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. That is God's plan in action, guys. So wherever God led them, wherever persecution drove them, they were preaching the word. They weren't getting hung up on, oh, we're missing the people we can't see. They were preaching the word wherever they went. And you start to see the disciples spread out. <clears throat> and I'll show you a little map here. You can see they were moving around. So they started in Jerusalem. Then they went to Judea. And this is just according to what Jesus even said. They would be his witnesses in Judea, Judea Samaria, right? The uttermost parts. And so we see them spreading out. Judea, they went down to Gaza, into Samaria, north, Caesarea, which is out by the coast, and eventually even up into Damascus. And so we're seeing this spreading. And Saul suspected that they would be coming to Damascus, which was the nearest important city outside of Jerusalem that had a huge Jewish population. And so Saul, who is working against the church, trying to persecute the church and, and to squelch it, is trying to get out in front of this expansion. He sees what's going on. By the way, we know from Philippians chapter 3 that Saul was what? A Pharisee. You understand now. This explains why he was such a zealot, right? He was all about keeping the law. He was very passionate about this. And so he gets permission to arrest the disciples when they show up at the synagogues in Damascus. This is what he was doing. Well, we know from the story that on his way to Damascus, the Lord knocked him down off of his horse, knocked him to the ground, and blinded him. And Saul would then become God's chosen vessel for spreading the good news, especially among the Gentiles. And so this is a huge part of the story. Understand, Paul was Jewish, but he was from Tarsus, which is part of Asia Minor, current-day Turkey. And he was a Roman citizen. So get this, he's fluent in both Jewish and Greco-Roman culture. This is very significant, guys. He's fluent in both of these. He's native to both of those cultures. And I want to ask this question because I think it applies to a lot of people here at our church at Renew. God has given some of you, and I'll ask it, I'll let me ask the question, has God given you the special ability to minister to various cultural groups? Because I want you to know that is a special gift and he expects you to use it. You know, sometimes you see this in the form of second generation people who are here in the greater Toronto area. Guys, you have a gift. You're not only fluent with the culture that you or maybe your parents came from, but also with the Canadian culture. And it gives you the ability to really reach different groups. And Saul's addition to the church really changed everything because he was like this. He was native to both the Greco-Roman culture and the Jewish culture. And God's going to use this in his life. But there's this shift that's taking place. We said the gospel went first to the Jews, but over time it's going to start going to the Gentiles. And even as Paul is being integrated into the church community, 
God is working on the other apostles to get them to make this shift. And he starts by working on Peter. He gives Peter this vision and he has him visit a Gentile, Cornelius. And that's forbidden. Like you don't stay at a Gentile's home. And then God undoes the Jewish dietary code through this vision that he gives to Peter. And he says, no, you can eat anything. It's all good. And Peter's like freaking out. He's like, no, this can't be. But God is preparing him for the opening up of the gospel to the Gentiles, to the nations, to everyone. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 10. This is great. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and who does what is right. Peter was starting to understand the actual heart of God, that his heart has always been for all people. He just used the Jewish nation to get to this point. And as Peter is speaking, the Holy Spirit actually comes upon the Gentile audience that he is speaking with. And there on that day, we see the first mass Gentile baptism being held. It was like big night out on steroids. It was incredible. In chapter 11, Peter has some explaining to do to his Jewish brothers when you get there. But you know what? They're cool with it. When they see this is what God's intending, this is what's going on, they were cool. In fact, they say, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life in chapter 11, verse 18. You know, I wish that the Jewish Gentile division was solved so easily. (laughs) It wasn't. That wasn't the end of it. In fact, it's not until Acts chapter 15 that we see the matter coming to a head and finally getting resolved. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But I want to talk about the church in Antioch as well, because this is a very significant development. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 11. It says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, guys, this is really significant. We're seeing the turning here. First of all, we see the gospel continuing to spread, and they're moving northward, so that's important. But then we also see that God was inspiring other people, not just Peter, to go to the Gentiles. See, this was a bigger thing. He was using Peter, but then he's using these other people also to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And very soon, Barnabas brings Paul to the city of Antioch, and together they begin to teach the crowds there. And Antioch became a significant city and sending point for the Christian movement. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, and that's really important to understand. It was this connection point between Jew and Gentile, and in that moment, that's where the church really began to explode. And so Antioch, and this is called Antioch of Pisidia, there's another Antioch up in Turkey, but Antioch of Pisidia became the launching point for Paul's three first missionary journeys. Well, that brings us to Paul's strategy here a little bit, because Paul also had a strategy that he employed, and no one was used more by God to spread the gospel across the known world than Paul was. And like I said, Paul engaged in three missionary journeys that we see in the book of Acts, and then one more after the book of Acts. And we're able to piece it together that he went to Spain, looped back to Asia Minor, and then back to Greece, and eventually returned back to Rome, which is where he eventually died. But he would take traveling companions on these trips, on these missionary journeys. This was Paul's vision. He always wanted to expand uh, the gospel and take it to different parts of the world. And on each journey, he would go farther and farther away. He started by going into Asia Minor, then into Greece, then he would come back home. But on those trips, he would preach the gospel and he would establish churches. He would get groups of believers together who would start meeting locally. Then on subsequent trips, he would go back and revisit those towns. And then he would appoint elders and establish elders in those churches to give clearer instruction and leadership. And he would give extra instruction through the letters that he wrote. Some of those letters became our New Testament books today that we call the epistles. But Paul would preach at synagogues for the Jewish audiences, but then also at Gentile gathering places. We see him uh, in Athens speaking at the Areopagus, which is where, you know, all of the people would gather, especially people of a philosophical bent that wanted to discuss current affairs and philosophy. But Paul's goal was eventually to make it to Rome. This was his big goal. You see this through the book of Acts. And after a series of trials, 
he eventually appeals to Caesar and that's what ends up having him go on a ship as a prisoner to Rome. But understand, guys, this Jewish and Gentile division and this tension um, that was going on as the gospel shifted from being Jew only to also the Gentiles. And this brings us to the Jerusalem Council. This is a very important part of history that you need to understand because it really dealt with this divide. We discussed earlier how Peter had some explaining to do when it came to him staying with a Gentile and undoing the dietary laws, right? His fellow Jews were not really happy. Even some of the apostles, right, were not really happy with this. And as you may expect, those changes didn't come easily. Many Jews hung on to aspects of their past faith. And you need to understand when, you know, religions come into clash like this, it isn't uncommon, even for Christians today, to have difficulty letting go maybe of some of the previous religious habits that they had from a former uh, religious system that they were a part of. And we see the same thing happening back then. Let me give you a little challenge in that regard this morning. If you are someone who left a past religious heritage when you came to Christ, I want to challenge you this, this morning to re-examine those traditions and to move past them to a new and deeper way of seeing your faith, the, the new and deeper ways of Jesus. And so I would really challenge you, study your Bible, see what the Bible is really asking of you. Speak with older, mature Christians and have them help you in this. And maybe some of them had to go through the same process where they had to kind of leave behind certain trappings of other you know, religious systems that they were a part of but they will help you and encourage you and get you to focus on what's really important. You know, at the Jerusalem Council, you see it in Acts chapter 15, the top church leaders were gathered and the big question was this, what was required for Gentiles to be accepted by God? This was really the big question. Everyone wanted to know, which makes perfect sense for where everything was uh, happening at that time. Particularly, one of the questions was, could Gentiles be received into the church without being circumcised? right? Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. He was given this rite of circumcision. This was something that identified the people of God through the centuries. Well, after much discussion by Paul and Barnabas, it's James, actually the brother of Jesus, who arises and gives the conclusion to the Jerusalem council. Now here it is. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shake your boots, right? It's going to rock your socks off. Look at this. Here's what he says. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues <clears throat> on every Sabbath. So this is interesting. Circumcision was not necessary. We see that. Paul would address that more in his writings as time goes on, and you're going to see that in the New Testament. Neither were the rituals of the law necessary. And this is an important kind of nuance to understand as you're reading your New Testament, guys. You're going to see when you get to the book of Romans. So note this, okay? When Paul talks in Romans about the fact that we are saved apart from the works of the law, that is the primary idea or context behind his words. It's these Jewish rituals that they were questioning. This goes right along with what was happening at that time in the council at Jerusalem. Now, we also believe that that truth extends to other works that people try to do in order to gain God's favor. I think that's a consistent application that we continue to make today, that it's not by works that we are saved. But that was the original context, was these rituals that Jews were hanging on to. But the things that James prescribes here at the Jerusalem council are kind of interesting. You'll notice the first thing he says, abstain from food polluted by idols. Now, that's really more an issue of conscience and Paul later uh, addresses that in his writings. The second one he says is abstain from sexual immorality. Now we know from Old and New Testament scriptures that this is anchored in God's timeless decrees. This was something that never changed, but they wanted to clarify this at this moment. And then they said also to abstain from meat, from strangled animals and blood. Now we don't do this today, obviously. This is not part of our practice. What was going on? Guys, this was a concession to the Jews. This was really something that was God speaking through the leaders of the church at that time saying, listen, this is going to be a difficult change for them. 
rather than offending the Jews everywhere you go, you Gentiles, why don't you just abstain from this and you're going to get along better with your Jewish brothers and sisters. So it's very interesting. We see God's grace in all of this. A change was happening. It was a seismic shift that was taking place. But God asked Jews and Gentiles alike to be sensitive to the other side as this transition took place. And guys, I think that that's a really great lesson, even for us today. You know, we need to give people ample space to grow, especially in lesser non-essential matters. Sometimes, guys, what we do is we take non-essentials and we elevate them to the point of being essential and we fight over them. That's not what God wants. You know, in the very next chapter, Paul, who would later teach that circumcision wasn't necessary, actually asked Timothy, a Greek convert, to be circumcised before taking him on his missionary journey. Is Paul contradicting himself and what just took place at the Jerusalem Council? No, he wasn't. But he was actually thinking of the Jewish people that he was trying to reach, and he wanted to eliminate a barrier with those weaker brothers. And so he asked Timothy, who was a Greek, right, a Gentile, get circumcised. You say, whoa, that's a big, that's a big request. But Timothy was willing to do that in order to reach his Jewish brothers for Christ. And so Paul actually teaches in Romans 14 that we can lay down our rights, guys, in order to accommodate weaker brothers and sisters. That's a Christian principle that we really need to come back to and understand. And so this is really important. Make note of this. We always need to remember what is most important. Sharing the gospel takes precedence over our smaller differences. Let me end this morning just by kind of sharing a little story with you. I remember when I came into the fellowship that we're a part of today. We're part of the Karis Fellowship, also known as the Grace Brethren Fellowship. And when I came into this fellowship, you know, I had actually grown up in a number of different churches. And the church where I became a believer was a Baptist church. And when I was baptized, I was dunked in the water one time backwards, right? It was actually in a river in Nova Scotia. It was a great experience. It was something that, you know, really changed my life and my perspective. And it was a very powerful and moving and special moment to me in my life. And when I became part of this fellowship 25 or so years ago, I was asked what I consider being rebaptized. And I thought, really, why, why would I do that? I was baptized before. And it was explained to me, well, you know, you're going to be planting churches for this fellowship. And our tradition here, as we understand scripture, we see being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I see that. And I see that that is a very biblical, you know, interpretation of that passage. And so I looked at it and said, you know, part of me inside was like, is this negating my baptism? Is this, you know, lessening what I did? And I came to understand, no, it wasn't at all. But this was something that I could do to build bridges with people that I was trying to work with in the future. And so guys, I think that that's a really important lesson. It was something that was even part of me being part of the fellowship that I'm a part of today. And I can tell anyone that I baptized three times in the water, I've done that as well. It wasn't the first way that I was baptized, but we have to learn what's most important and what's not. And guys, what's most important is that people come to Jesus and get baptized. And that's the real important thing. 